On March 10th, 2023, Meta announced that they would no longer be offering bonuses to Reels creators on Instagram or Facebook. This was a massive surprise given that everyone else was doubling down on short form content in order to compete against TikTok. But Zuckerberg had chosen to go against the grain and pull back on short form content. Why? Well, promoting Reels was actually losing Meta quite a bit of revenue. It turns out that people scrolling through Reels is a lot less profitable than people scrolling through the Instagram feed. $500 million less per quarter or $2 billion less per year to be precise. Hearing this, you're probably inclined to think that Reels were taking a massive toll on Instagram's top line, and that's why they decided to pull back. After all, if this was WhatsApp, that $2 billion toll would be twice their total annual revenue. But the same cannot be said about Instagram. In fact, it's actually the exact opposite with Instagram. In 2023, Instagram is expected to pull in just over $50 billion in revenue. Let me put that in perspective. That's $20 billion more than YouTube, $37 billion more than TikTok, and over 11 times more than Snapchat. In fact, Instagram is the second most lucrative social media platform in the world, only beaten out by Facebook themselves. So out of all the players that are pursuing short form content, Instagram is actually the most well off. And that $2 billion toll only translates to 4% of their annual revenue. So Zuckerberg's decision to pull back from shorts is less of a financial move and more of a strategic move. Of course, he's not just gonna remove reels altogether from the platform and stay completely out of the loop. But it's clear that he would rather continue to focus on core Instagram products and treat reels as an addition to the business as opposed to the future of the business. And given how well Instagram is already doing, this is definitely a strategic calculated choice. But all of this still leaves the question, how in the world does Instagram make so much money off of just pictures in the first place? To understand how Instagram became so lucrative, we first have to take a look back at its roots, which take us back to 2009, to a young man named Kevin Systrom. Kevin was your classic high-achieving tech bro. The man started off by attending Stanford, where he majored in management science and engineering, before turning around and interning at Odeo, which is what would eventually turn into Twitter, before finally getting a job at Google. As you can see, Kevin was truly an elite tech bro, so I don't think you'd be surprised to hear that the idea for Instagram actually came rather naturally during a vacation. It turns out that his girlfriend didn't want to post vacation pictures on social media because she felt that the pictures weren't high quality enough. Kevin's solution to this was to just throw on a few filters, and this is what would lead to the idea of Instagram, though it was originally called Bourbon. From there, it didn't take long for Kevin to put together a prototype for Bourbon and to pitch it to a few VCs at a local party. The VCs would agree to fund him with $500,000, allowing him to quit his job and go all in on Bourbon. Initially though, it seems that Kevin was actually all over the place. He wanted the app to do as much as possible from checking into hotels to earning points for attending social events. It wasn't until one of his college friends, Mike Krieger, joined that their vision became a lot more focused. Mike was adamant that people did not want a complicated app and that simplicity was key. As such, the duo would decide to hone in on just photo sharing and to make that as polished as possible. And eventually, on October 6, 2010, Instagram would be launched on the App Store. Within just the first day itself, Instagram would rack up 25,000 users. By the end of the first week, this turned into 100,000 users, and by mid-December, this turned into 1 million users. One of the main reasons for this explosive growth was Instagram's crystal clear focus, which translated into a crystal clear demographic, which is the first reason that Instagram is so lucrative. Their demographic is not only crystal clear, but it's also highly monetizable. Just think about it. What type of person is most likely to use Instagram? With YouTube, it's basically everyone as YouTube serves all sorts of content from comedy and gaming to education and finance. At first glance, it seems that Instagram also serves all sort of content. But when we take a step back and look at the overarching picture, one adjective comes to mind. Aspirational. More times than not, people don't go onto Instagram to look at something truly funny or entertaining or educative like they might with YouTube. 
They go on to Instagram to look at things that they don't have, whether it's the perfect body or the perfect relationship or the perfect vacation or the perfect wealth. And the fact that people only post highly doctored, curated versions of themselves only plays into this phenomenon. This is why Instagram is commonly cited as the worst social media for mental health. But while this sucks for users, it's perfect for the platform, as this creates the perfect breeding ground for advertisers to play into users' insecurities and dreams and maximize on conversion rates. When you combine this context with the resources and influence of Facebook, well, all of this just gets put into overdrive. Facebook got involved with Instagram pretty early on, just 18 months after launch in fact in April of 2012. Facebook would buy out the entire company for just $1 billion, which at the time seemed like a massive amount, but Zuckerberg clearly knew what he was doing. After the acquisition, Kevin was for the most part allowed to run Instagram as an independent business that simply had access to the resources of Facebook, which was extremely powerful. Instagram had the agility and speed of a small startup, but also the resources and backing of a social media giant. And Kevin would make great use of this by venturing into the world of copying. There's really no easy way to put this. With the help of Facebook, Instagram would just go around and blatantly rip off features from the competition. The most blatant examples of this are of course stories, IGTV, and reels, but there are dozens of smaller examples. Usually, there's no point in suing when it comes to tech, because even if you somehow win the court case, the infringer will probably get the last laugh. If Instagram was still just a startup, maybe the competition would have at least tried though, but since they were not part of Facebook, no one even bothered, giving Instagram free reign to experiment with whatever feature they wanted. Instagram was never adamant about any one of these features though. They always had the approach of, let's see how users respond and how this affects the business overall before making a decision. Pulling back on Reels is just the latest example of this. Just two years ago, they completely scrapped the idea of long form content through IGTV because according to themselves, users just weren't using it. This freedom to experiment with anything and everything with little repercussions and consequences gave Instagram the opportunity to really find the most successful and lucrative features and double down on them. But all of that only tells half the story as Facebook brought something even more important to Instagram, advertisers. Before Facebook got involved, Instagram didn't even have advertising. In fact, it's not clear if Instagram made any revenue at all, but Facebook would change this. In November of 2013, Instagram would show off their first sponsored post, an ad from Michael Kors. Users weren't too happy with this ad, but Michael Kors was. In fact, within just the first 18 hours, Michael Kors would gain 34,000 new followers. Instagram ads are obviously nowhere near as effective today as users have gotten used to them, but compared to other platforms, Instagram is still miles ahead. The average cost per ad click on Instagram comes in at $3.56, which is even higher than YouTube which comes in at $3.21. This is especially surprising given that on YouTube, ads usually come in the format of unskippable videos. On Instagram, on the other hand, you can easily scroll past any ad. So you would think that getting clicks on YouTube would be more expensive, but it's actually more expensive on Instagram, largely because of their demographics and context. It's a lot easier to sell a product to someone who wants to be something else as opposed to someone who just wants to get to the video already. As such, the only social network that has a higher cost per click than Instagram is LinkedIn, but that's a whole other beast. Between the freedom to experiment and opportunity to leverage first class advertising, it seemed like Kevin's partnership with Zuckerberg was going quite well, but this honeymoon phase didn't last forever. As Instagram started doing better and better and even started outshining Facebook itself, the company started having some serious internal politics. The Instagram team felt that Facebook got a steal with the acquisition and that they were the future of Facebook. Meanwhile, the Facebook team felt that the only reason that Instagram was so successful in the first place was because of Facebook's backing. And as you would guess, this drama went all the way to the top, to Mark Zuckerberg and Kevin Systrom. Eventually, it got to the point that Zuckerberg just wanted Kevin and Mike to leave so that he could take the reins of both Facebook and Instagram and reunite the companies. 
Zuckerberg didn't want to flat out to fire these guys though, so instead he would just start cutting resources and implementing changes that would piss them off. For example, when Kevin was on paternity leave, Zuckerberg would implement location tracking and hamburger menus into the app, two features that Kevin was strongly against. And eventually, Zuckerberg would come out on top and both Kevin and Mike would leave. But being the undisputed king of both Instagram and Facebook wasn't the only place that Zuckerberg didn't have to share. One major advantage that we have yet to discuss is that Instagram doesn't have to share any of their ad revenue with their creators, largely because their creators aren't after cash directly. More times than not, the main goal of Instagram users, whether it's the popular kid in high school or some massive celebrity, is to boost popularity and stay relevant as opposed to making money. Of course, making money is often part of it, but with Instagram, it's more of something that follows as opposed to something that leads. As such, the fact that Instagram doesn't share revenue with their creators isn't something that really turns away creators. Of course, there are some exceptions to this and Instagram does pay creators under certain circumstances. But when it comes to the main feed, Instagram gets to keep all the ad revenue, which obviously makes a massive difference. YouTube shares basically half of all the revenue with the creators. This means that the total revenue that YouTube pulls in is not 30 billion, but actually closer to 60 billion or higher than Instagram, as you would expect. So why is Instagram so lucrative? Well, they have a unique aspirational demographic that's perfect for advertising. They've been able to experiment with every format under the sun to find the most lucrative and successful formats. And historically, they haven't had to share much revenue with creators. When you combine all of this, you end up with over $50 billion in annual revenue. Meta as a whole pulls in $126 billion in annual revenue and they're worth just over $800 billion. And if we were to translate this ratio over to Instagram, it would mean that Instagram is worth over $300 billion by themselves. And that's why Instagram is the real winner when it comes to short form content. They're not staying out of the loop by ditching reels altogether. But at the same time, they're also not willing to cannibalize their main business in order to make reels work. With historically high interest rates, the appeal of bills and bonds is higher than ever. Yet traditional brokerages haven't really adapted with the times. They still expect people to use clunky bond tables, scroll through long overwhelming lists, and even use virtual keyboards till recently. And that's why we created our own modern bond platform, Silo. At Silo, we prioritize the user experience and the ease of finding and investing in the issuers you know and trust so that you too can easily lock in high yields. Also, choosing a strong user experience does not mean sacrificing on safety. Every Silo account is insured by $500,000 in SIPC insurance and $2.5 million in FDIC insurance. Also, all funds deposited on the platform will be maintained by our trusted custodian, Interactive Brokers, who has experience managing $373 billion worth of assets over the past 45 years. So if you're looking for a modern way to invest in bonds, please consider checking out Silo in the description below. It doesn't seem like YouTube got this memo because that's precisely what they've been doing. Check out this video to learn more, but until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.